שלום וגוד איבנינג, ליידיס וג'נטלמן, פרופסור צבי ארד, the president of Netanya Academic College, דוקטור דוד אלטמן, senior vice president, דוקטור ראובן פדצור, manager of דניאל אברהמס סנטר, דוקטור ברי פיינשטיין, manager of the conference, and uh, distinguished guests. I'm here to deal with the uh, subject which actually I believe has become to be the main threat for meanwhile for the state of Israel. And this is the assault on Israel's legitimacy and I will talk about its roots, engines and the tools are used by them, and of course the tools that we should use in order to meet the challenges ahead of us. The legitimacy of the State of Israel is recognized by the international community and by the Jewish people itself. It's a core concept underpinning Israel's security rationale and forms the basis for all other components of national security. Therefore, the attempt in recent years to delegitimize Israel is a major threat to our national security and to the security of the Jewish people. This assault on Israel's legitimacy is moving from the margins of the political discourse to its center, thanks to an unholy, unholy alliance between radical Islam Arab nationalists and radical and naive liberals in the Western world. This unholy alliance managed to plant its demonizing libels and misconceptions calling Israel an apartheid state and a war criminal and claiming that the conflict with the Palestinians is a territorial conflict which started with the so-called occupation of 67 and not an existential conflict that has to do mainly with the Palestinian refusal to accept Israel as a nation state of the Jewish people. In the conceptual build, building blocks used by the majority of the public in the free world while discussing the Middle East in general and particularly the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I want to focus today on the development of this phenomenon in the liberal democracies in the West and avoid spending time on the well-known leading delegitimizers of Israel in the Muslim world from Ahmadinejad up to the Palestinian delegitimizers in spite of their important contribution to the growing strength of the delegitimization campaign. There are several reasons to my mind, why this is happening in the West. First, Israel focused for a long time on thwarting the attempts of its enemies to get rid of the Jewish state through the use of military or terror means and did not give the same emphasis to fighting the political warfare that was waged against it at the same time. We have been always criticized for not doing a good enough Hasbara and for not being able to translate military achievements into political capital. Secondly, since we were successful in the military side and in fighting terror, we started to look more like a Goliath and less like a David. The Palestinians, on the other hand, were very successful in presenting themselves as the victims with which liberals in the free world can easily identify. Third, the dominance of radical postmodernist and post-nationalist epistemological authorities in the battle over the conceptualization of the problem in the Middle East, pro-Israeli epistemological authorities are much less effective and listened to. Fourth, the transformation of the discourse about Israel's legitimacy 
from being security or values dominated to being dominated by human rights issues. It happened right after the end of the Cold War when Europe started to feel more secured and while the authority for defining human rights was left in the hands of NGOs governed by radical anti-Israel liberals or by na nations that are famous for their respect of human rights like Sudan and Libya, whereas those who truly care about human rights like the well-known Robert Bernstein, the founder of Human Rights Watch, were pushed out of the way. Fifth, the growing fear of the free world from radical Islam and the adoption of a dehemi attitude towards it, towards it in an attempt to appease it. Sixth, the adoption of these attitudes by a considerable part of the mainstream media in the West. And finally, the intentional or unintentional involvement of many Jews, including Israelis, in this campaign in a way that weakens considerably the ability of the pro-Israeli forces to stand in front of this delegitimization campaign. The main engine that enables the delegitimizers to gain influence is their ability to form a network of all organizations that is loosely connected but highly determined and motivated. Anti-Israelism, more often described for political convenience as Palestinianism, is becoming sort of a new religion and faith. And the believers have, of course, no interest in the facts. This new faith enables its believers to overcome their feelings of guilt toward Jews and Muslims and to retain their anti-Semitic feelings in a time where anti-Semitism is not acceptable anymore. But this engine by itself would not have been sufficient had it not been met by the engine of Western conceptual failed characters like naivete, wishful thinking, self-guilt, solutionism, and naoism in the free world of the liberal democracies and of the Jewish people themselves. I can give many examples to these conceptual failed characters which dominate actually the international political discourse, the international public discourse, in a way the Israeli political and public discourse. And this is, I believe, the main problem when we have to deal with ourselves in order to meet the challenges. In addition to these conceptual characters, failed characters, ignorance and political correctness make it easier to manipulate, deceive, and delude Western like-minded people regarding Israel's geostrategic situation as well as its challenges. It is this engine that enables the delegitimizers to create the impression that Israel alone bears the entire responsibility for the difficulties in the peace process and is guilty of crimes against humanity, while the truth is quite the opposite. The delegitimizers use a variety of tools. On the political level, they focus on educating political leaders and brainwashing them with their ideas and on public diplomacy operations like the Goldstone Report, the flotillas, and the flightillas, like the one we experienced yesterday. They make, for that purpose, an impressive use of the media, both the old and the new, as tools for indoctrination of the public and the political leadership. Toda. At the same time, they work very hard on education, mainly in the campuses, abroad, and through trade unions. More specifically, 
their tools include what has been termed the 70s, namely delegitimization, dehumanization, demonization, disinformation, double standards, defama defamation, and denial. With the use of these tools, they try to, first of all, isolate Israel outside the international state system as a Perier state that maintains an apartheid regime over an occupied people. Secondly, distort the international law to prevent Israel from defending its citizens against physical attack, like Goldstone Report and so forth. Thirdly, deny the historical link of the Jewish people to Eretz Israel and to its capital, Jerusalem. This is a major point in Chairman Abu Mazen's approach that emphasizes the refusal to accept Israel as a Jewish state and by his decision to award Helen Thomas, the American correspondent, for her call to the dismantlement of the Jewish state. And last and not least, advance the Palestinian agenda of unilaterally imposed statehood on Israel as a step in the stage dismantling of the country, the phases theory. This political warfare against Israel and the West is characterized by a perversion and weaponization of international law, humanitarian ideals, and human rights. Second tool, a war by anal analogy, fabricating false analogies that compare Israel to the Crusaders, colonialists, Nazi Germany, and the former South African apartheid regime. And the third tool, an effort to boycott Israel, divest investment from it, and sanction it, BDS. To confront this campaign, we have to unite our people behind the common denominator of preserving Israel's right to exist as a free and democratic nation state of the Jewish people. It has the right to defend itself and developing new epistemological authorities that will immune the public opinion from the impact of the false messages of the radical delegitimizers treat and heal the discourse from those false concepts that were already planted in it and fight against the delegitimizers in a way that will make it much more difficult for them to operate. Just like we did in so many cases in recent months, including yesterday with the flight dealer. This, of course, doesn't mean that we are closing our ears to criticism of our policy. We are an open and democratic society, and we are willing to have an open debate and to investigate ourselves if necessary. Unfortunately, we had such example yesterday with the wrong behavior of Lieutenant Colonel in the Jordan Valley, which should be investigated and probably we will find what is needed to be found. Uh, and we can't justify any behavior like that, even if there were provocations by anarchists or whatever, as long as this officer was not under real threat to his life, uh, he shouldn't uh, behave in this way. In order to be victorious in this war of delegitimization, asbara or public diplomacy are important, but not sufficient. There is a need, first of all, for clarity. Clear understanding of the challenges ahead of us as Western like-minded people who sanctify life rather than death, who promote human and women rights who live in democratic societies and appreciate freedom, liberty, and tolerance, and are challenged by ideologies which promote the opposite. There is a need for 
clear strategy to meet these challenges. And there is a need for moral clarity that in many cases is missing. And in order to prevail in this war, which is not just the war of the state of Israel. Yes, it is a clash between civilization, and we are part of the Western civilization. There are two important tools to be exercised by Western leaders. Leadership and education. Leadership to show the way and to set up the objectives for the government as well as for the Western societies. Education to avoid ignorance, ignorance and overcome the conceptual failures. This is the way to prevail, and I am sure that in the end, we are going to prevail. Thank you. The minister is willing to answer questions, so please. Marty, yes, please. Martin, have a microphone. Rega, Martin, it's the accord. Good sir. אנשים בממשלה מדברים על פתרון שתי מדינות. ראש הממשלה דיבר על זה בבר אילן. האם יש הבטחה למישהו בעולם שהמדינה הפלסטינית שתהיה ביהודה ושומרון נוסף על עזה, שהיא לא תהפוך למדינת חמאס גם היא מתישהו? Anglit. Okay. So I believe that the question has been translated to English. Uh, the policy of our government is very clear. And Prime Minister Netanyahu articulated it in many cases in his speeches. First of all, we don't like, we, we don't want to govern the Palestinians. And actually, they enjoy already political independence. They have already two political entities. One in Gaza, led by Hamas. We call it Hamastan. The second one in Judea and Samaria, led by Abu Mazen, by the Fatah, Palestinian Authority, or whatever. With the uh, political entity <coughs> in the Gaza Strip, we have very hostile relations. And we have to deter them. In order to have any political engagement, they should have met or should meet the criteria of the quartet, and they are not ready to meet it. So we have to deter them. We do it quite successfully. Uh, the people in the South usually enjoy relatively calm situation, and whenever we absorb any provocation of rockets or mortar launching or whatever, we respond in such a way that they have to consider using this kind of tools. Talking about the Palestinian Authority in uh, Judea and Samaria, in Ramallah, we said from the very beginning, we are ready to sit at the table in any minute. They reject it. They set up certain preconditions. We are ready to sit at the table without any preconditions. Having said that, to understand the policy, Abu Wazan doesn't want to come to the table. As he escaped Olmer's proposal, which according to former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice was very generous, even surprising, he didn't even consider it. He rejected immediately. And Arafat rejected Barak's proposal in Camp David. The good news is that Abu Mazen learned the lessons of uh, terror doesn't pay off. 
but he used some other means to fight us. He calls it uh, whatever, political rejectionism, Bukawama, Siasie, popular rejectionism, Bukawama, Shabie, and of course trying to delegitimize us by using all this of this kind of anarchist provocators, campaigns against us. So he doesn't want to conclude any final settlement based on the two states for two people's formula. He doesn't want. So we say we are to sit at the table. We are many topics to talk about. We are going to raise three questions around the table. First of all, are you Abu Mazen? In any final settlement based on green light, a grid lines, are, going, I, are, are you ready to recognize our right to exist as a nation state of the Jewish people? Yes or no? We got a clear answer, never. So what we are talking about. The second question is linked to the first one. Are you ready to acknowledge that any final settlement based on a grid line between the two sides is going to be considered as the end of conflict and the finality of claims? He claimed, he claimed again and again. How come? What about the five million refugees? Unless the last one is satisfied, it's not the end of Congress, it's the finality of claims. For those who believe in the two states, for two peoples along the 67 lines. And another issue that he raised publicly recently, he considered early on, but he, he raised it publicly. What about the Palestinians of 48, namely the Israeli Arabs? Really, he is going to represent them? This is a faces theory. Let's eliminate the state of Israel step by step, face by face. So if the 67 lines are not going to be considered as the end of the finality of claims, what are we going to talk about? And the last questions that we raised publicly and in front of our allies, are you going, the Palestinian Authority, to address our security needs in any final settlement. And unfortunately, we have very bad experience with you. Any territories that was delivered to your responsibility after Oslo had become to be greenhouse, safe haven for terrorism, homicide bombers launcher, until we moved from the defense of the, to the offense and defensive shield 10 years ago, we absorbed more than 1,000 casualties. Instead of land for peace, we got land for terror. And instead of land for peace in the Gaza Strip, after Im implementing the disengagement plan, we got land for rockets, thousands of them. With this in mind, can we afford snipers in Jerusalem? Mortars from Bethlehem to my office, it is within the range, or rockets toward our uh, international airport, in Ben Gurion Airport, or Tel Aviv, or whenever, Natania. Yes. So, uh, with this in mind, we claim, let's talk about bottom-up issues rather than top-down issues. And we are not going to discuss territory, although we were under pressure, to include American pressure, to discuss, first of all, territory. Again, to deal with an issue in which we are going to pay and not to get anything. No way. <clears throat> so let's talk about bottom-up issues. Let's improve your economy, governance, law and order, security, but the cornerstone that which they try to avoid is education. And to be very clear, as long as they educate their young kids to wear explosive belts, and to hate and to kill us. There is no chance for peace, even with your, we are going to sign agreements. As long as Israel doesn't appear on their maps, till now, looking to their textbooks. All the land of Israel from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River is covered by the flag of the PLO. Israel doesn't exist. No chance for peace. As the kids are educated, the occupation started 63 years ago, listening to Abu Mazen's speech in the General Assembly. Can we ignore it? 
occupation since 48, not from 67. So it's about our very existence. It's not about the boundaries of Israel or its, its uh, size. No chance for peace. And, of course, he, he denies any linkage between the Jews and the land of Israel. He denies the existence of the Jewish people. He claims that Judaism being a religion, it's neither people with no nationality, so why should the religion have a state? But if we go back to the topic that we discussed today, unfortunately, they succeeded in planting in many circles in the West and in Israel, deluding, deceiving, our, our people, and our people are ready to be deluded and to be deceived by themselves because of naivete, wishful thinking, self-guilt, solutionism, nowism, ignorance, and political correctness. This is the war that we had to fight now in order to have a better future. Listening to what you said, I find it difficult to understand why the Israeli government still validates Palestinian claims for, uh, for statehood. Because I think if the difference between tactics and strategy is that tactics you deal with how to face or contend with existing problems, strategy you visualize a desired reality and strive to achieve it, I think most of what we've heard here is the tactical. And unless Israel rejects the validity of Palestinian statehood, there is no way to achieve legitimacy. Because once you recognize the legitimacy of Palestinian statehood, all efforts to ensure Israeli security become invalid. Because if they have a right, how can you subordinate that right to, to, to Israeli security? One word, Reuven. If you want, and I think the reason. I th um, one comment to your comment, Martin. <clears throat> In many circles, I feel like that I have to convince people that the world is not flat anymore, it is circle. And it takes time. So it's not just a matter of strategy. It's a tactical matter as well. How to convince people believing in false, very dangerous paradigm to believe that it is not anymore a flat world, but a circle one. That's my answer. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm sorry I have to ask in English. My favorite uh, my is not so good. But I want to ask a question about the, the delegitimacy. It seems to me from reading the, the press in the States uh, and in here that uh, one of the key factors, the key ways that the, the Arabs try to delegitimize Israel is what they're doing in the, in the Shtachim, in the territories with the building, the continued building, and they claim that they won't talk to us unless we stop building, and we're building illegal settlements, et cetera, et cetera, and we're taking a lot of, a lot of negative criticism from the world because of that. And what I want to ask, I myself have been here now a few months. I've seen with my own eyes the amount of building and construction going on in the Arab towns and the villages all over the territories. And I'm wondering to myself, why are we just taking this criticism and we're not answering back? You know, why is there nothing being done to, to, uh, to watch the level of construction in the Arab, Arab areas? And why is nothing being done to, to uh, publicize the fact that they're doing illegal construction all over the place. Why is there no one tracking the funding, where they're getting the funding for the illegal construction that they're doing? These are disputed territories. We're both making claims to this, but you would think from what you see in the press around the world that we, only we, are building on land that they claim is theirs. And so why are we not countering? If they want us to freeze construction, so why should we not demand that they also freeze construction? <coughs> The settlements issue is the most difficult one to explain all over the globe. 
first of all, because of us. It has become a general wisdom that the obstacle for peace is the settlements. It has become general wisdom that Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria are illegal. We admit this is a disputed land. It's not an occupied land. It's a disputed land. So far, according to former government's decision since 67, Israeli government decision. But how come, that's my claim, it has become a general wisdom, first of all in Israeli, certain Israeli circles, and then all over the globe, that the Arabs have the right to live everywhere in the land of Israel. We don't deny the right to live in the Galilee as Israeli citizens, or in uh, Haifa, or in Jaffa, or in Ramla, or in the Negev. Not talking about Janine Nablus. We don't deny the right to live there. How comes that it become general wisdom, especially among human rights activists, that there are certain territories in the land of Israel, in Eretz Israel, which are forbidden for Jews? It's because of us because of the Israeli political and public discourse. There are Israelis, less than in the past, who really believe that the obstacle for peace is uh, settlement, which is nonsense. Having said that, today I visited uh, East Jerusalem, and uh, I found that uh, Jews build Arabs, construct their buildings. And uh, I told the mayor of uh, Jerusalem about uh, foreign affairs minister uh, from specific South American country, which uh, raised the issue of settlements, saying, I visited Ramallah, and I learned from Salam Fayyad that the Palestinians are not able to build anywhere, neither in Ramallah, nor in Jerusalem, not talking about Judea and Samaria, general speaking. And the Jews build here and there and demolish the uh, Palestine. Uh, I said, you are very wrong. You are actually ignorant. And you have to learn, first of all, the facts. We do, not, we do nothing regarding their construction in Area A, like in Ramallah, Jenin, Nablus, or Area B, in the Palestinian villages, they can build whatever they want. It is their responsibility to build or not to build. And in Jerusalem, there are those who build with the uh, municipality approval, and there are those who build without the municipality approval. We are not going to uh, ignore it, and we are going to deal with it. And the Jews have the right to build everywhere according to the government uh, policy. Those are the facts, and you have to learn it. Having said that, it's quite difficult. Uh, we don't dominate all the uh, uh, media assets all over the globe. And this is a time for each of us. And I urge you to do it, to disseminate the facts, articles, data, uh, uh, directing people to our websites to look at uh, the Jerusalem municipality regarding Arab construction, Jewish construction, and so forth. So you can fight this war, this war of de against delegitimization of the State of Israel, each of you, by uh, blogging, chatting, uh, disseminating articles, and so forth. And I urge you to do it. Fair enough, thank you, but we need the information. If the government can help us by providing the information. I can show you the website in which you will find the information. Uh, in the United States, uh, as you probably know, there's a problem with probably the majority of young people who although they are not anti-Israel, have become disinterested in Israel because they think that Israel is not uh, projecting itself as a light unto the world uh, with a message of hope. And my question to you is, how can we, I and others, approach these people who have simply 
uh, dropped out. They're not anti-Israel, but they simply are not interested because they have been uh, led to believe that Israel does not have a message of hope and a message uh, to be a light unto the world. The best way for uh, Jewish youngsters from abroad to know Israel is to come to Israel, either by birthright, by Massa, or by themselves as individuals. And I meet these groups, especially young students, didn't have in the past the opportunity to, to witness Israel, they are really surprised from the vibrant country, from uh, the flourishing country. Uh, and uh, this is the best way which I can recommend you to educate the Jewish youngsters from abroad to come to Israel. And those that don't come, is there anything we can do? And uh, we send messengers uh, to campuses more and more we spend more money uh, to have uh, Israeli students and messengers on certain campuses. We prepare them here, we educate them here to deliver our messages. And again, you can use the internet, you can use the, uh, all the tools which are available in the new media era uh, to, to try to educate them uh, within the community, outside the community. Uh, that's what I can recommend you.